In this keynote, I will tell you about how we can use reconfigurable intelligent surfaces in order to combat fading and interference in wireless communication systems. And I'm Imam Bjørnsson. I'm a professor at KTH, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm and at Linship University. So in this presentation, I will first give you an introduction to wave propagation in general and what is multipath fading and in that context i've also talked about beamforming and this type of reconfigurable intelligent surfaces which is the main topic of this keynote then i will talk about how we can optimize reconfigurable intelligent surfaces first in general in order to improve communication performance then how channel hardening is an effect that enables us to combat fading and then how different types of electromagnetic interference is behaving when we are using these type of surfaces. Can we improve the interference situation as well? And then we will summarize the results. And these are some of my funding agencies when it comes to the research that I'm doing in this area. In general, we would like to provide reliable wireless communication services everywhere. And when we are using our mobile phones, we can live with that some locations we have bad service we can just move to another location and then we can carry out our call or download a movie or whatever we would like to do with our device but when we are moving to the industrial internet of things where we are deploying different types of devices everywhere to do different kinds of measurements then they might be at static locations they cannot move and that makes it more important in order to try to deliver good service everywhere this is complicated because we don't want to deploy infrastructure everywhere. I mean, in principle, we could next to every device put up a wireless access point, or we can even use cables, then it's not wireless anymore. But that's not the purpose. We would like to be able to deploy a wireless network in an economical, feasible manner and still deliver good service everywhere. And the bottlenecks that we need to live with is fading which is that the service quality is going up and down even in areas where it's supposed to be good. And also interference that comes from other types of systems or from the same system when we are deploying networks that we cannot control everything. So how can we mitigate fading and interference? Well, we first need to have a look at how the wireless infrastructure is characterized and what kind of evolution has happened in 5G. So traditionally, a cellular network consists of sector antennas, which are put on rooftops or in towers. They are covering the users in a 120 degree sector on the horizontal plane. And then we are focusing the signals also downwards to earth where the users are. So users that are standing in that sector, they will get the strong signal. However, if there are objects that are blocking the signals, we will still lose a lot of the signal power, which is the case for this unfortunate user here behind the building. It will still get some signal through, might, maybe not through the building, but it might be reflected off a building here. And due to Snell's law, the signal that is coming in from one angle here will leave from the same angle but in another direction. And most of the signal power will therefore not reach its user, but some of it will, and that is enabling us still to connect to network, but we will get poor service. So what has we done in the recent years in order to improve the service here? Well, we have been replacing this traditional fixed kind of sector antennas with something called adaptive multi-user beamforming or massive MIMO. These are arrays with many small antenna elements that can create constructive interference patterns, meaning that we can change the directivity. We can even send multiple directive signals in different directions at the same time. And we will see in a moment how that is done. But the general thing here is that we can transmit to multiple users in different locations at the same time, and it will be more directive. So we can direct one beam towards this user here, which will get the same or better service than in the past. But also this unfortunate user here can get at least slightly better performance because we are now focusing a signal beam towards this building here as well. And then we cannot change how Snell's law is behaving. The signal will still get reflected in the wrong direction, but at least some of it will make it around the corner here. The next step in the future in 6G might be that we can somehow control objects in the propagation environment. 
And of course we cannot rotate the building, that doesn't make sense. But can we somehow deploy new type of equipment, for example, on the face of a building like this, in order to change the direction of the reflection? Well, that is what we can do with reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, also known as meta surfaces or intelligent reflecting surfaces. So there are many different names for the same kind of main technology. Some of them coming from the hardware side, where meta surfaces is something that we can actually build. And then the reconfigurable intelligent surface or RIS or intelligent reflecting surface IRS. These are two names from the communication theory area about how we could use this kind of meta surface for wireless communications. And that is what I will mainly focus on. And I will use this RIS abbreviation in this keynote. Before I can explain how a surface like this is behaving, that can control reflections, let us recap some basic wave propagation. Here is an antenna that is sending out a wireless signal and it spreads out in all directions. And as you can see, the further away we are from the antenna, the larger will be the waves. So that also means that when we are observing the wave at the distance d from the antenna, then the power density will be inversely proportional to d square. Why d square? Well, 4 pi d square, that is the surface area of a sphere with radius d. So the power is vanishing very quickly with the distance. And it, apart from that the signal is propagated like this in free space, it will also interact with objects. If the object is smooth, then if radio waves are coming in from a particular direction, here shown as rays instead of waves, well then it will be reflected, and this is the Snell's law behavior that I was mentioning earlier. If it comes in with a certain angle, it's going out with the same angle, but on the other side of the normal that is orthogonal to the surface. While if we have a rough surface like this, every piece of the radio wave that is reaching it will be reflected in a different direction. So we get what is known as scattering behaviors. So even if we are sending out just one wave, we typically get a multitude of waves that are reaching the user from different directions due to reflections or scattering on different types of objects. And this is giving rise to what we call multipath fading. So from a transmitter to receiver, there might be many different propagation paths. The signal is going out from it, it bounces up different objects, and it makes it to the receiver. Each of the different paths will have a different length, and that is creating different phase shift, different delays of the signal when it reaches here. And when we are getting multiple copies like this, and in particular when we have, say, eight copies or so that have roughly the same signal power, we can model this type of summation of signal at the receiver here as something called Rayleigh fading, which is a random distribution. So if the gain G here is complex Gaussian distributed with zero mean and variance one, well then the absolute value have what is known as a Rayleigh distribution. And depending on when we are moving this receive antenna back and forth just a little bit, we will get large variations. We get new random realizations of the fading process here. And if we look here at the probability density function of a Rayleigh fading uh, channel, we take the absolute value and we see here is a different value that we can have. Notice that we have a logarithmic scale. Then most of the channels are rather good. They are around their average, which is one. But we also have a substantial probability that we have a much worse channel. And that happens when these different paths are starting to canceling out each other. They have different faces so that they are canceling out each other. So we can see here, for example, that it's only 0 0.1 with 20% probability, or uh, it has lower than 0 0.1 in that case, and it has lower than 0 0.01 with the probability that is a few percent and so on. So at some locations, we will get bad performance, even if we on the average have a good channel. So this kind of variations that happens to channel quality due to the multiple propagation is creating a unreliability. And look, for example, in the situation where you deploy a sensor somewhere, it could be in the factory, it can be essentially anywhere. And we are looking at a small area where we will, will be deploying the sensor or where some kind of device will be located. And into this area, there are six different propagation paths coming into it. 
then if we are looking in this area over one by one meter and the wavelength here is 0 0.1 meter which is 3 gigahertz band we can see that the normalized path loss that we will observe is varying a lot if we are lucky it's up to one we have normalized it to 0 db that is one but if we are unlucky the sensor will be at a location where we have essentially zero or at least it's a million times weaker than it is uh, in the best locations here so that is not a big problem if you're making a phone call to someone and they say oh I can't really hear you you just turn around or you move a little bit and then all of a sudden it works better but if you deploy a device somewhere and it will stick there forever then if it is in a fading dip that will be a problem and you say oh, but, but of course I will not deploy it at such a location no but once you have deployed it something else will move around in the propagation environment and all of a sudden you are in a fading dip so this is a main problem that you will sometimes have fading behaviors even if you have a strong channel so what can we do about it well what if we take our six different uh, paths here all of them being equally strong and uncontrollable they have some kind of random faces when you're adding up over this area so, and we can just control one of them we can change its face so that it aligns with the faces of all the other ones the summation of them well, in that case, we can get a, a normalized path loss here over the entire area, which is rather good. It never goes down to these low peaks that you can see over here. It's always is going between maybe zero and minus 10 dB or something like that. So it is never very bad. And what is important here is that when we are controlling the phase shifts of one of the six different paths, then we will never suit all location at once. We have for every location here, control it so that we get the good service quality there. And then at the next location, we get the good service quality there and we need to change the control of this one. So we need some kind of variability in how we are controlling the faces. So we are not achieving all this simultaneously, but when it is your device turn to communicate, somehow if you can just control one out of the many different paths, well, we can improve the service quality a lot, particularly the reliability, because we never get this bad service. So how could we potentially achieve something like this? Well, let's look a little bit more into the math. When we are transmitting a radio wave, we typically are changing the amplitude of phase of a sinusoid with a certain carrier frequency. So for simplicity, say that we are sending a sinusoid 2 pi fc, this is the carrier frequency, which might be 3 gigahertz, and here's the time t. And the radio wave is then propagating, and it reaches the receiver through a direct path and through a reflected path on this building over here. And here I'm showing the two different components. Both of them is a sine of 2 pi fc t, but then depending on the length of the different paths, we have different delays, tau 1 for the black direct path and tau 2 for the reflected path. Moreover, I was talking earlier about that the signal is getting weaker as it's moving over larger distances because the signal power is sort of spreading out. This is represented by the rho term here. Square root of rho 1 is telling you how much is the amplitude reduced and rho 1 is then the, how much the power is reduced. And then the same thing for the green path, we have a rho 2 parameter here, which is telling us how much we are losing over that path. So when we are adding these two things up, it is a summation of sinusoids. So you might be familiar with some of the uh, results saying that if you add two sinusoids up with the same carrier frequency, well, we still get the sinusoid with that carrier frequency. It just gets uh, a different amplitude and a different phase. And in order to rewrite things, we can first say that, that we have a certain propagation distance, d2 over the green path, d1 over this path, we are changing fc times tau 1 to d1 divided by lambda the wavelength uh, and we do the same thing over here when we add them up together we can write it as something that has an amplitude change and a phase change and suppose that the two amplitudes are the same so we neglect those ones and we only are looking at what is the difference between these two different phase shifts well then the summation of this one will tell us uh, how if they're adding up it constructively or not 
if both of them are positive at the same time and negative at the same time, well, then they will reinforce each other and give us a stronger value. So for example, if the path difference is zero, so d1 minus d2, and here we have normalized with the wavelength, lambda, if that path difference is zero, so both these paths are equally long, well, then the two paths are identical. We get two copies of the same signal, and therefore the amplitude is doubled. And therefore the power, we get four times the power. However, if the two paths here are having a path difference, which is uh, minus half a wavelength, well, in that case, we get one sinusoid and minus the same sinusoid, and then they're canceling out each other. So then we get no amplitude at all. And it is these variations here when paths like this are adding up with different phases that is creating a fading behavior. So sometimes we might be at this location, sometimes when we are moving the receiver, we'll be down here and have a deep fade, and sometimes it's going up again. But suppose we are at a location where we get this value here. So it's not uh, super bad, but it's not up in the maximum balance as well. What could we do? Well, if we are stuck at these two locations, maybe we can change something here at the location where the signal gets reflected. So say that we can control the phase shift somehow that is created when the signal gets reflected here. In particular, we can delay it a little bit more so that we get a longer, larger phase shift. So we take the same signals here as before, but we add an additional phase shift in the materials that is in the surface here. Well, in that case, we can tune this phase shift so that the two paths are adding up constructively. Both of them are positive at the same time, negative at the same time, and so on. How can we achieve something like this? Well, there are certain types of hardware that can do this. Here is a prototype that some of my colleagues in China was creating. It is a prototype for the 5.8 GHz band. It contains 20 rows and 55 columns of small elements that we call RAS elements. And for each one of them, it is a small patch with a controllable bias voltage. So how that we can control in order to change what is known as the reflection coefficient. What is a reflection coefficient? Well, it is essentially something that is determining what fraction of the received signal will get reflected and with which delay. So it is determining the impedance of the element and then we have the impedance of the uh, surrounding air and the fraction computed here between the impedance of the air and the impedance inside of the uh, element here is determining the reflection coefficients. So you can find the details in this paper here uh, about this particular prototype, but let me show you some of the results. If you are looking at the phase shift of this complex number here uh, with an expression that is given in the paper, well then what you can see is that depending on what bias voltage that you're applying to the diodes in this element, what we can achieve is that at the 5.8 GHz frequency, we can get different phase responses, different phase shifts. If the bias voltage is zero volts, then we have maybe minus 111 uh, as our phase shift in degrees. And as we are increasing, the bias voltage to 4, 7, 11 voltage, we can see that we are going up and up and up. So we can vary the phase shifts from minus something to plus something. We have at least a 180 degrees controllability of the phases. And this is what is allowing us to say that when the signal comes from one of the elements, we can control what phase it will have when it gets received at the desired location. In addition to changing the phases, depending on what bias voltage we are applying, we have different kinds of resonance behaviors inside of the elements, which is creating some amplitude variations. But in this talk, I will neglect those ones, but they exist in reality. They are relatively small. We might have an amplitude response that is varying from that. We get 75% of the amplitude up to 95% perhaps, but those variations are much smaller than the important phase response variations. So before I tell you how we can make a surface reflect signals in a controllable manner, let's look at how antenna arrays in 5G are doing this. So I was telling you earlier that an 
one antenna is sending out the signal in all directions and it propagates and becomes larger and larger and larger. If we have two different antennas that are sending out the same signal at the same time, then we see that their signals will interact in the air. And in some locations, if you have put the receiver here, it will receive the signal from both of these transmitters at the same time. They will be exactly in phase. And this happens now in this direction upwards. Here we will observe what is known as constructive interference, which means that the two signals will automatically add up constructively. That was what I described earlier as well, the sinusoids add up in a positive manner. And what this really means is that if we have one antenna that is sending out a signal, all of them equally strong in all directions, we put another one next to it that is doing the same thing, then when we are observing the signals in different directions, it will look like as if the transmission had some kind of directivity from the beginning, which it didn't. But uh, over there, that directivity is created. So this happens when we have two antennas that is sending the same signal. What if we would like to get a constructive interference in a different direction? Well, what we can do, if we would like it to go up towards the upper right corner here, is that we delay the signal in the right antenna a little bit more. And then we can see that it haven't propagated as far, so the green ones are adding up constructively in these directions. So this is where we get the constructive interference now. So if two antennas are sending the same signal but with different delays or different phase shifts, that is the same thing, then we will get the constructive interference in the controllable direction. And this also happens when these things are not antennas, but they are elements in the surface that can reflect signals. And that is what is happening when we try to form beams with a reconfigurable intelligent surface. So we have a transmitter that is sending out a signal. And part of it is reaching a surface like this. And it reaches the surface already with some delays. And then we can figure out somehow how we will get the signals reflected towards the desired location. What kind of phase shift will the path from the transmitter to one element and to the receiver here get? And then we can figure this out for all of the different elements and we can tune the phases by tuning these bias voltages so that all of these different elements are sending the, out the signals so that their signals over the air are combining to form a strong directivity towards user one here. The colors here are describing different types of phase shifts on the different elements. And we have a controller that we can control the phase shifts over time, apply a new set of bias voltages, and all of a sudden we have a signal that is getting a strong reflection towards a different location instead. So each element here is a passive patch that's just reflecting the signal that comes into them. But we have a switch or a diode that we can control in order to determine what delay or what phase shift it should assign to the signal. And the phase shift pattern over the surface is determining directivity. So each element is typically sub-wavelength sized because the smaller the elements are, the more they are reflecting the signals in all directions. And we want that to be the case because it is not the directivity of an individual element that is determining in which direction we get our beam, but it is the constructive interference between the different elements. They should make sure that the signal are adding up over the air in the direction of interest. So if we go in a little bit more in the mathematics, how this works, say that we have a transmitter sending a signal to a receiver. We have an uh, RAS here with capital N elements, and this is element lowercase n. So we have a channel to this element. We have some kind of controllable filtering that happens here by controlling the bias voltage, and we have a channel to the receiver. And each of these components is characterized by certain things. So from the transmitter to this element, there is an amplitude loss that I call square root of alpha n. And there is a time delay tau n a. And from the element here to the receiver, there is a particular amplitude loss square root of beta n. So it's still the nth element. And there is a propagation delay tau n b that's happening. And then these two things are given by nature when we have fixed location on transmitter and receiver, but what we can control is what is going on within the element. 
And for simplicity, the amplitude loss is a constant here, square root of gamma, but we have a controllable time delay or phase shift that is happening within the surface. So the received signal will be the summation over the signal that's coming over all of these capital N puffs. We're adding up the signals via the different elements, and then we add some noise. And what will happen then is that the signal that comes from the transmitter is going through element n. In this case, we get an amplitude loss of square root of alpha n. We have square root of alpha bn, and we have square root of gamma. So that product is giving us the total amplitude loss for that particular element. Then we have a delay to the surface, from the surface, and within the surface. We add up those delays, and we have an e to the power minus j2 pi fc, which is the carry frequency. This is the total delay of the propagation. The signal gets multiplied with that and we add noise. And this is our total propagation model. So this is our propagation model. And what we would like to do is to tune the surface in such a way that we can get a strong signal at the receiver. So how can we do that? Well, this is the part that gets multiplied with the signal and we would like it to be as large as possible to maximize the signal to noise ratio. And what we can control is this particular delays here. So what can we do? When we try to maximize the signal to noise ratio, we take this summation here, we take its absolute value square, and then we try to maximize it. And what you can show using, for example, the Cauchy's Schwarz inequality, but also some logic. If you add up positive and negative numbers, they are partially cancelling out each other. While if you add up uh, positive numbers, they are stacking on top of each other. And in the same way, if you have complex numbers and you add them up, well, you would like all of them to point in the same direction in the complex plane, so all of them have the same face. So if all of them have the same face, well, then this part here can be removed from the absolute value, and we get the maximum number then, which is the absolute value square of the summation of all the elements, and then we just add up their amplitude losses. We achieve this when we are adding different phase shift within the surface so that all of the paths from the transmitter via uh, the surface to the receiver becomes equally long in delay or at least in phase. So that uh, this term here is the same for all of the different elements. Then we get constructive interference at the location of the receiver. And to get some more insight into what happens with the expression here, say that alpha and beta are the same for all ends. We can drop the n here and it becomes approximately n square alpha beta gamma. So we have a multiplication of the path loss to the surface and from the surface and the loss within the surface, but we also get a square of the number of elements. We would like to have a large surface with many small elements in order to get a strong signal to noise ratio. So this was some theory. Can we build something like this in reality? Yes. In this paper that I was describing earlier with the prototype, uh, we also made experiments with this particular surface. So for example, here we have on the rooftop uh, of a building a transmitter with a horn antenna that is directing the signal in this direction and 50 meters away from it we put up a copper plate. We are transmitting once again at the 5.8 GHz frequency, there's a 20 MHz of bandwidth there, it's a Wi-Fi band and there is a 13 dBm power. The signal is transmitted here and the copper plate will reflect it according to Snell's law essentially. We put up a receive antenna here and it's connected to a USRP that is uh, recording the received signals. And then here we are looking at the power over the spectrum. Here we have the 5.8 GHz band, and here we have the 20 MHz. And we can see that outside the desired band there is some background noise. And then we have some kind of signal within the band and then we have background noise again. But we can barely see the variations here. The maximum power is roughly 60, minus 66 dBm. So that is minus 66 dB of milliwatt. So it's a weak power. If we take this baseline copper plate and we replace it with a reconfigurable intelligent surface, the one that I described earlier, with roughly a thousand el small elements, well, now we can instead observe a strong signal within the band. So within the 20 megahertz of interest, we have a signal that goes up to minus 39 dBm. And then outside the band, we have some leakage, and then we go down to the noise floor out here. 
So we can see that we have essentially a 27 decibel stronger signal at the receiver, thanks to the fact that we are tuning this reconfigurable intelligent surface to maximize the signal power at the receiver here. So this is showing that this is something that actually works in reality. It's the same setup, we're just swapping the equipment from something that is passively reflecting the signals to one that can reconfigure itself in order to get the strong signal at the location of interest. Even if we can control all the propagation paths that go through this RAS, there will always be some additional paths that we can't control. So let's add them into the model here. Here we have the summation of all of the puffs. They have a particular amplitude loss and a particular joint phase shift that is coming between the transmitter and the receiver through the propagation environment that excludes the RS. And then here we have all the puffs as before that goes through the RS. We have the signal and it has a particular variance P and we have the noise that has a variance sigma square. Now the sync to noise ratio, we take P, the variance of the signal, we divide with the noise power sigma square and then we take this term here, absolute value square. So then using the same kind of course structure inequality uh, argument as before, we would like all of this n plus one paths to add up constructively. So we would like to make sure that all of them have the same phase. And since we can't control the delay tau d here of the direct path, we need to make sure that all of the paths that is uh, via the RAS is now tuned so that they are matching with the phase shift of the direct path. By doing that, we can remove all the phase shifts and we just get the summations over all of the amplitude losses. We add them up and square them. I have only talked about what would happen if we have a given value of rho and alpha and beta. But what if they are random? How will this affect our performance? Well, we can always tune the RAS for a given channel realization, but how large variations will we actually get? So to look into that, let's use the kind of Rayleigh fading models I've described before. So for each of the paths to uh, the surface, the square root of alpha n times the phase shift here, we can model it as being random. So there is a complex Gaussian distribution with zero mean and a particular variance that I call mu a. From element n to the receiver, I model its propagation path as complex Gaussian uh, with mu b as its variance, so it's the same for all the elements. And for direct path, I will sometimes also use a random modeling here, and then it's mu d that is the variance of this Rayleigh fading channel. And what we should remember is that even if they are all Rayleigh fading, they are typically not independent random variables in reality. Because when we are making a surface with small elements, the phase shifts cannot change that quickly over a surface. Uh, so, uh, for example, if we have elements that are quarter wavelength times a quarter wavelength, we have an isotropic scattering environment. So signal coming from everywhere, uniformly distributed towards a surface that is 10 uh, elements by 10 elements large. Then if we are looking at one of the elements and we look at what is the correlation between that element and the random realization that we can observe at different elements. Well, it has a correlation of one, of course, inside of itself, but then the surrounding ones have some correlations, then the correlation gets smaller and smaller. There are only a few elements that are completely uncorrelated, even in the isotropic scattering environment. So, so one needs to be a bit careful when analyzing these type of things. Sometimes this type of correlation is forgotten. But the important thing is that even if there are some kind of local uh, correlation between the different elements when they are small and when they are close together, we can still get the behavior called channel hardening. And what is that? Well, asymptotic channel hardening happens if the signal to noise ratio that I described earlier divided by n square converges to a constant as the number of elements grow large. And what we show in this paper here is that when we have isotropic scattering around the surface, so we have propagation uh, paths, this is sort of the worst kind of fading comes in from all directions. Then this term that we had on the previous slides, uh, if we take it and we divide with n square, then it converges to a constant, which happens to be the variance of uh, the paths to the surface. From the surface, that's mu a, mu b, we have the gamma from within the surface, 
and then we have a, a term here pi divided by 4 squared. This comes from the Rayleigh fading kind of distribution. So it converges like this and uh, that means that approximately, even if n is not infinitely large, we can say that the uh, term here that's showing up in a SNR will be approximately n squared times this factor. But we should also notice that the direct path is not showing up in this expression here. So we should be careful that when we have a strong direct path, it might take a while before this kind of asymptotics is kicking in. Let us now analyze these behaviors in the simulation setup, where we have a surface which is square shaped and we will grow its size both in the horizontal and vertical direction. And to each element, we have a path loss which on the average is minus 75 dB. And we have a transmit SNR, transmit power divided by noise power of 124 dB. And first we consider the case when there is no direct path, it is equal to zero. And we are showing two different cases. One is when we are optimizing the phase shifts within our uh, surface in order to maximize the SNR. And one is when we randomize the phases. And the blue curves here is showing the case we optimized. And we are changing the number of elements per dimension, both horizontally and vertically. And we can see that the SNR in dB scale is going up. What is particularly interesting here is also these intervals here. These are showing the random variations that we will get due to the Rayleigh fading. And it shows the intervals with 90% of all the random realizations. And we see that as we are increasing the number of elements, this, uh, these intervals are becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. So we get a more confined randomness around the particular SNR value as we are increasing the size of the element. And this is the channel hardening behaviors. If we would have random phases and we are growing the size of the surface, we still get a higher SNR because more power gets reflected, but not in a controllable manner. So that's why the intervals continues to be very large. If we add a direct path, in this case it's minus 130 dB, so it's rather weak, but still exists, we can see that the asymptotic expression was a dashed line here, and it's almost on top of the optimized case already from the beginning. So uh, we were converging to the asymptotic limit rather quickly. In this case, we are seeing a much smaller benefit from growing the RS when we are not changing the phases on it. They're just random. It's just uh, almost flat all the time. And it also takes a while before the RS is big enough so that its paths becomes equally strong or stronger than the direct path that we can't control. But when that happens, around here, we start to converge to the asymptotic expressions. And now we also get smaller and smaller variations due to the channel hardening behaviors. And this is when it becomes very useful to have these surfaces if they are large enough. Because we could start from a situation without an RS where we would have a particular SNR. And in order to guarantee our performance everywhere, we will have to cut down on what SNR we can allow our system to utilize. But if we are instead saying that we are deploying a surface which is 20 by 20, and we would like to make sure that we are operating our system at an SNR where the receiver can always, with a high probability, decode the signals, well, now we can increase the SNR that we can utilize, where we can expect from the users substantially, both due to the share increase in signal power and due to the smaller variations thanks to channel hardening behaviors. So we get a better reliability when we have an RS, which is big enough to make a difference in terms of the SNR calculations. So let's go back now and think about, so the SNR is proportional to N squared. Why is that? Well, we have a transmitter, we have a receiver, and we have the RS here. And the element in the surface is n in number. And between the transmitter and the surface, we have some kind of aperture gain. When we are increasing the number of elements, we are increasing the size. And therefore, we are, of course, uh, getting a, a larger fraction of transmitted power that is reaching this one. It's like uh, thinking about the solar panel. The larger it is, the more energy it will collect. So there we get an aperture gain of n. 
and then when we are taking the signals and each element are reflecting them with the control phase shift that is when we can get a beam forming gain the signals get reflected towards the receiver and that is where we get the second n here so n times n gives us an snr proportional to n square what is important is that the beam forming gain is only for a desired signal and only when we are tuning the surface while the aperture gain applies to any signal any noise uh, and any interference and whatever should show up there and we saw it also in the previous example that even if we are not tuning the surface we will get the aperture gain and this is problematic to some extent in particular when it comes to things that are not controllable like electromagnetic interference in the factory environment it might be a lot of equipment that is creating electromagnetic noise that is sent out in there. It could also be other systems around that are leaking into our signal bands or whatever interference sources there are. The important thing is that when they are incident on an RAS, the RAS will reflect that signal as well. It doesn't mean that it will change its directivity in a controllable manner. Uh, so we will not get the beam forming gain, but we will still see the aperture gain. We can view this principle a bit like painting the walls of a room in different colors. If you paint them in black colors, the room will feel dark. If you paint them in white colors, you will get a room that is much brighter. So you have different light sources that comes in, creating some kind of interference in these cases. And the brighter the walls are, the more of the signal will get scattered within your room. And that was creating more electromagnetic interference within the room, which might lead to that it feels brighter but in communication scenarios when it's radio waves it will also create more interference within the room so this is an issue with this kind of surfaces that any kind of signal gets picked up and reflected maybe not towards the receiver but still it will create more interference within the area and i will now show you that there are situations when the rs might even reduce the snr so we need to be careful when we're deploying this kind of and equipment. So say that mu a and mu b is now minus 82 dB. This has assumptions from our brand new paper, electromagnetic interference in RAS aided communications. And we have the same uh, transmit power divided by noise power. And this is a thermal noise. But we also have some kind of isotropic electromagnetic interference. So towards the surface there comes in signals uh, that are interfering with us from all different directions. And in this case, the SNR will approximately, you can find the exact expression in this paper, but approximately we will have the transmit power multiplied with the factor that we had before, the square root of rho, the direct path, plus n times the square root of alpha, beta, gamma. And then we square these things. So that's why we have an n square eventually. Then we have the noise power that we divide with, but also some kind of factor n, which has to do with how large the aperture, the larger size is of our RAS and a constant that comes from this electromagnetic interference, how strong the signal is. So the received noise or interference that the surface is reflecting into the room will be proportional to the size of this RS. Here's a simulation result showing what can happen depending on how strong the direct path is. We start with the case when the direct path is weak, minus 130 dB. Now we have three curves in this case without uh, any electromagnetic interference, when we are increasing the size of the RS both horizontally and vertically at the same time, we see that the SNR is growing very rapidly. When we don't have any RS at all, we had this kind of flat curve. And when we have electromagnetic interference, we see that we still get the growth, but it's not as quick because we have an N square here and we have an N here. So the SNR will eventually only grow linearly with N and not quadratically. When we have a slightly stronger uh, direct path, so rho is equal to just minus 120 dB, so it's still rather weak, but stronger still compared to the first case, we see that when there is no electromagnetic interference, we get something that is growing with the number of elements. And here is the SNR you will get without an RS. And if we are now considering the electromagnetic interference, we can see that actually we get less SNR. It goes down and 
and down and then it starts to slowly go up again when the surface becomes larger. So what is happening in these cases? Well, the row here is big enough so that this term here that comes from the RS, its contribution to the received signal power is negligible. So even if you increase the number of elements, this path here still remains rather small compared to the power carried by direct path up until a particular point. But we are still adding more electromagnetic interference. So the contribution that the RS is providing in terms of collecting more uh, electromagnetic interference and spreading it out into the room will still lead to that the SNR goes down. Then eventually the path via the RS becomes dominant over this path and then uh, we are still seeing the benefit and it goes up again. But it tells us that the RS can sometimes reduce performance when we have electromagnetic interference. However, the asymptotic SNR will still grow with number elements, but not with n square, but rather with n due to the electromagnetic interference. So we only get the beamforming gain, not the aperture gain, because also other kinds of interfering signals get an aperture gain. So a careful deployment is necessary in order to make sure that we can actually benefit from the RS in such a way that we are improving the SNR at the location of the users at the location where we will deploy our sensors and not reduce them. So to summarize, this keynote has been about reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, which is something we can utilize in order to control certain propagation paths in our environment. And here is yet another example of that. We have a base station sending out a radio wave. We have some uncontrollable path that is reaching me both uh, through the wall here and going through the window and being scattered on various objects and make it to me here. And this is creating some kind of fading behaviors. But then if we are deploying an RS at a particular location and we can control all the paths that get scattered by that one, we can create a strong beam towards this um, location where I am. And I can move around, we can change the direction of the beam and make sure that we get the strong signal everywhere. We can create channel hardening so we are alleviating the coverage hole by reducing the random variations, in addition to also getting a stronger signal on the average. We have smaller variations around the average. And interference can be a bottleneck because they are also uh, reflected. Uh, so if the, there is some kind of interference created here and it reaches the surface, they will collect more and more interference and spread it out through the room, not in a direct manner, but still scatter it. So in certain case, we can get an amplification of them. So we need to have a big enough RS and deploy it at a good location in order to actually improve our sync to noise ratio. So is ARS a solution to provide more reliable communications everywhere? Well, I think it might be one component to achieve that. It might, however, not be the only solution. There are many other types of methods that can be utilized, deploying more small cells, deploying relays, but it is one of the hot topics that people are looking into a lot and it is good if we can make this kind of technologies completely passive. So it just observes signals that come from some locations and they reflect them towards the desired locations to get rid of coverage holes. If we can do something like that and not have any power consumption in the surface by itself, well then we can do something that other technologies can't do. So with that, I've reached the end of this keynote, and if you would like to hear me talk more about this technology, you can listen to my podcast, Wireless Future, where there are several episodes that are talking about reconfigurable intelligent services, and there's also a number of other YouTube videos that you can watch where I'm talking more about the details of this technology.